Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Science, and today I want to discuss compatible observables. This is another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. The first question you probably have is what are compatible observables? They are simply observables that commute. The second question is why are compatible observables important? The physical properties associated with compatible observables can be measured simultaneously in quantum mechanics. By contrast, if two observables don't commute, for example the position and momentum, then it is impossible to measure the associated properties simultaneously in quantum mechanics, and that leads to some of the strangest features of this theory. In this video we're going to prove the basic mathematical result that underpins all of these ideas, which is that two compatible observables share a common set of eigenstates. So let's go! The starting point today is this equation here, showing two Hermitian operators A and B that commute. The key result of the video is that if A and B commute, then it is always possible to find a common set of eigenstates of A and B that form a basis in state space. I cannot emphasize enough how important this result is in quantum mechanics. It implies that these two observables can be measured simultaneously, as I discuss in the videos on measurements. What I want to do in the rest of the video is to prove it. The proof relies on both the matrix formulation of quantum mechanics and the properties of Hermitian operators, so make sure you have seen those videos before moving on. What I want to do in this first slide is to give you a sketch of the proof, and the rest of the video provides the details. Let's imagine we have calculated the eigenvalues and eigenstates of A. We can write the operator A in matrix form in the basis of its own eigenstates, and in this basis the matrix is diagonal, and the diagonal entries are given by the eigenvalues of the operator, which I call lambda. I imagine that I have some degenerate eigenvalues, so I have g1 lambda1 entries, g2 lambda2 entries, and so on. The eigenstates of A that share a given eigenvalue are not uniquely defined, we can make linear combinations amongst them to find new sets of equally valid eigenstates. The matrix A will look diagonal in any of these possible bases. Moving to B, if the eigenstates of A that we have chosen as a basis were also eigenstates of B, then B would also look diagonal. What we will see in this video is that an arbitrary choice for the eigenstate of A will in general not lead to eigenstate of B. In this case, B looks almost diagonal but not quite. There is a block here of sites G1 by G1 with non-zero entries arising from the eigenstate associated with lambda1, then a second block of sites G2 by G2, and so on. The entries are zero outside these blocks but not within them. A matrix of this form that is almost but not quite diagonal is called a block diagonal matrix. In this video we'll see that we can play with the flexibility we have here to make linear combinations of eigenstates of A, and we will always be able to find at least one linear combination for which the resulting states are also eigenstates of B. With this special choice of basis, then the matrix B will also be diagonal. Once we have done that, then we can make the statement here. So if you only remember one thing from this video, it should be this result. Operators that obey this result are called compatible observables in quantum mechanics, and as explained in the videos on measurements, compatible observables can be measured simultaneously. To prove the intuitive result we just discussed, let's start with the eigenvalue equation for A, which is A psi equals lambda psi. The first thing we want to prove is that the new ket chi, which is obtained by acting with B on psi, is also an eigenstate of A with the same eigenvalue lambda. To do this, we act with A on chi. We then use the definition of chi to write it out explicitly in terms of B and psi. As A and B commute, then we can exchange them to obtain this. Using the fact that psi is an eigenstate of A, we can write this, where we have moved the scalar lambda to the beginning, and finally we obtain lambda chi. As I claimed, A acting on chi gives lambda chi, so chi is also an eigenstate of A with the same eigenvalue lambda. So what does this imply? First, let's imagine that lambda is non-degenerate. You'll remember that this means that lambda has a single eigenstate associated with it, although this eigenstate is only defined up to a multiplicative constant. We have just found that both psi and b psi are eigenstates of lambda with the same eigenvalue. This means that b psi and psi must be the same eigenstate up to a constant, and I will call the proportionality constant mu. But what is this equation now? It is just an eigenvalue equation for b, which tells us that psi is also an eigenstate of b with eigenvalue mu. So what does all of this mean? If A and B commute, and their eigenvalue spectra are non-degenerate, then the eigenstates of A and B are the same. 
This is it, we have proved the statement made at the beginning of the video when we have non-degenerate spectra. When we have degenerate eigenvalues, the situation is a bit more complicated. To understand what happens in this case, we first need to lay out the notation that we will use. Let's consider the eigenvalue equation of the Hermitian operator A as written down here. I've written its most general form, in which lambda n are the eigenvalues, and different eigenvalues are labeled by the index n. Psi n i is an eigenstate which I have here labeled with two indices. The index n is telling us that the eigenstate is associated with the eigenvalue lambda n, and the index i is telling us that there may be more than one eigenstate with the same eigenvalue lambda n. i runs from 1 to g n, and it tells us that there are g n eigenstates that share the same eigenvalue. What do we know about the eigenstate of a Hermitian operator? In the video on Hermitian operators, we learned that for an n-dimensional state space, there are n linearly independent eigenstates. This means that capital N must be equal to the sum over the gn values. To see this explicitly, we can write out all eigenstates in order, starting with the eigenstates corresponding to eigenvalue lambda 1, which are psi 1 1, then psi 1 2, all the way to psi 1 g 1. Then we start with the eigenstates corresponding to lambda 2, and so on. There are g1 eigenstates corresponding to eigenvalue lambda 1, g2 corresponding to lambda 2, and so on, and the total number of eigenstates is n. Before moving on, remember that we can make any linear combination between the states in g1, or between the states in g2, and so on, and the resulting new set of n linearly independent states will also be eigenstates of A. This last observation about linear combinations means that we can make alternative sets of eigenstates of A by rotating those that share the same eigenvalue. This is the key idea behind Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization, which I introduced in the video on Hermitian operators. It allows us to turn the initial set of eigenstates of A, which are linearly independent, to a new set of cats, which are also eigenstates of A, but which form an orthonormal basis. Moving on, I will assume that we have already done this, so that the psi and i are themselves mutually orthonormal because now we have a composite index ni, orthonormality tells us this. The rest of the video relies on the matrix formulation of quantum mechanics. We know that the matrix representing an operator written in the basis spanned by its own eigenstate is a diagonal matrix, with the diagonal entries given by the eigenvalues of the operator. That means that in the psi ni basis, A will be a diagonal matrix in which all off-diagonal terms are zero, and I schematically represent it like this. We want to prove that if A and B commute, then we can find the common set of eigenstates for A and B, such that when we write A and B in this common basis, both of them are diagonal. To start, let's see what the operator B looks like when written in the original basis psi ni of eigenstates of A. The relevant matrix elements are B n i n prime i prime, which are given by this expression. We usually have a single index for each basis cat, but here we explicitly keep two because we want to make sure we treat the genesis properly. So what does this matrix element look like? Let's start with the case for which n is different from n prime, which corresponds to eigenstates of A with different eigenvalues. As we have different eigenvalues, the index i doesn't really matter in this case, so to simplify notation I will omit it for the time being. We can write psi n a b psi n prime, and we can then use the fact that psi n is an eigenstate of A with eigenvalues lambda n to obtain this expression here. If we instead look at psi n b a psi n prime, we can again use the eigenvalue equation for a to get lambda n prime, and then we obtain this. Because a and b commute by hypothesis, then these two terms are equal, and we can set the right-hand sides also equal to each other. As we're considering the case in which n is different from n prime, then this term is not zero, so this equality can only be true if the matrix element of b vanishes. If we recover the i index, then we can write this final expression for n different from n prime. What happens when n equals n prime? In this case, the term here is zero, so we can no longer conclude that the matrix element vanishes. To make progress, let's write again that the matrix element of B between basis states corresponding to different eigenvalues vanishes. Let's then repeat the list of eigenstates that we wrote at the very beginning, taking into account the g-fold degeneracies of these states. What we want is to build the matrix representation of B in this basis, and to do that we start with the top left square corner. It gives a square portion of the B matrix of sites G1 and G1 corresponding to the representation of B in terms of the blue basis cats that all share the eigenvalue lambda 1. 
The matrix elements of B in the blue square share the same n, so we cannot say that they are zero, and the shaded region signifies that they are in general not zero. We can then do the same for the set of green eigenstates, which gives the next block in the diagonal of sides G2, spanned by all the eigenstates corresponding to eigenvalue lambda 2. Again, we cannot say that the matrix elements inside the green block vanish. We can repeat this for the orange eigenstates corresponding to lambda 3, and so on. What we can say from the fact that the matrix element of B vanishes between eigenstates of different n is that all the matrix elements outside these colored squares are zero. A matrix that has this shape is called the block diagonal matrix, and unfortunately it is telling us that B is not diagonal when written in the psi basis of eigenstate of A, so A and B do not share this common set of eigenstates. But all is not lost. Let's focus on a particular block of the matrix corresponding to eigenvalue lambda n and of dimension gn by gn. In this block, the index n is redundant, so we can label the matrix element of B by the i and i prime indices only to write them like this. This is the part of the B operator in the block spanned by the A eigenstates corresponding to lambda n, and we can think of it as its own little gn by gn square matrix. As B is a Hermitian operator, then all its matrix elements are equal to their transpose conjugate elements, and in particular those in the gn block will also obey this relation. This means that the smaller bn matrix is itself Hermitian. As such, we can build its eigenvalue equation, which we write like this. The eigenstates phi form a basis in the gn dimensional space in which this bn matrix lives, and as such we can rewrite this bn matrix in the basis of its own eigenstates, with matrix elements as shown here, giving the bn matrix as diagonal in this basis. So how is this helping us? We can write the phi in the psi basis of eigenstate of the operator A, because those eigenstates also form a basis in this gn dimensional subspace. Let's act with A on the phi states. We can then insert the expansion of phi in the psi basis as shown here. A is a linear operator, so we can move it inside the sum to get its action on psi and j. The psi are the original eigenstate of A, and overall we get lambda n psi n j. This means that the phi eigenstates are also eigenstates of A with eigenvalue lambda. This of course was to be expected. The gn dimensional subspace is spanned by eigenstates of the A matrix that have the same eigenvalue, and we know from the video on eigenvalues and eigenstates that we can make any linear combination and obtain another eigenstate of A with the same eigenvalue. What the phi are is simply one such linear combination. But this is it. In the phi n basis, the part of the A matrix living in this G n dimensional subspace is still diagonal. What this all means is that although the original eigenstates psi of A associated with the degenerate eigenvalue are not necessarily eigenstates of B, and thus we obtain a block diagonal matrix for B in the psi basis, this here shows that it is always possible to choose in every eigen subspace of A a basis of eigenvectors common to A and B, which in this case is the phi basis. Therefore, in these five bases, we can write both A and B as diagonal matrices, and we have proved our original statement. If two Hermitian operators A and B commute, then we can always find an orthonormal basis of a state space made of eigenstates common to A and B. Now that we have proved what we set out to prove, we can write the eigenvalue equations for A and B with the common eigenstates phi and pi. In these eigenstates, the label n refers to the fact that the eigenstate is associated with eigenvalue lambda n of operator A, the label p refers to the fact that the eigenstate is associated with eigenvalue mu p of operator B, and the index i, like earlier, simply appears to deal with different eigenstates that have the same eigenvalue. With this, it actually becomes trivial to prove the inverse of the statement that we spent this video proving. If there is a basis of eigenstates common to A and B, then A and B commute. To show it, let's write A and B acting on the common basis ket phi. Operating with B on phi gives the eigenvalue mu, so we can write this. And then operating with A on phi gives the eigenvalue lambda, so we end up with this. Similarly, we can write B A acting on the common basis ket phi. Now we first operate with A to get lambda, and then with B to get mu. Subtracting these two equations gives this for the left hand side and the right-hand side vanishes. This gives the commutator of A and B acting on phi which equals zero. And finally, as the phi kets form a basis, we can write any ket in state space in terms of these basis kets, so this implies that A and B commute. 
Overall, if A and B commute, then we can find the common set of eigenstates that form a basis in a state space. And conversely, if two operators A and B have a common basis of eigenstates, then these operators commute. So what have we learned about compatible observables? We can find a common set of eigenstates for two operators that commute, and that in turn means that we can simultaneously diagonalize the matrices associated with these two operators. What we can do now is to define a complete set of commuting observables, which is something that allows us to uniquely identify quantum states. So I encourage you to check out the video on that topic. If you like the video or you would like to send me suggestions for future videos, please subscribe.